Good afternoon, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you to the uh, to this afternoon's le lecture. On behalf of uh, Catherine Babayan, director of the Armenian Studies Program, she couldn't make it, so I have been given the honor of presenting Murat Jankara, our speaker for today. Uh, already, uh, his biography has been published here, and I really don't want to waste your time uh, and his by reading this. Uh, but I was just talking to him that I envied him because he started uh, majoring in physics and math, and then he gave up, switched to literature, Turkish literature. I had another colleague who started as a marine biologist and switched to literary theory. I said, you're crazy. Why, why did you do that? That's so interesting, so fascinating. Imagine marine biology. And here, uh, physics and mathematics, I'm, s I'm zero in both. I, don't, I know nothing in the field. That's, I think, because of my teachers. Uh, I don't, did you switch because you had bad teachers too in physics and math? I <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, Dr. Jankara received his doctorate at, from Bilkent University in 2011, so it's just a couple of years ago. And his dissertation was titled Empire and Novel, Placing Armenian-Turkish Novels in Ottoman-Turkish Literary Historiography. Uh, lately, he's been uh, occupied almost uh, completely by uh, the what we call Armenian-Turkish literature, that is, Turki literature written in, in, in Turkish, but uh, in Armenian characters. And I'm very uh, delighted and privileged to be working with him as his associate here, uh, because he is really on to something very fascinating, very interesting, of which we knew very little so far, and we still know very little. Even though there are bibliographies, we know that there were hundreds of works uh, written in Armino Turkish. Uh, many periodicals that were published in Armino Turkish that have not been really tapped. And for a few years now, uh, I saw Gottfried. Yeah, Hagen and I, Gottfried Hagen and I, have been thinking about offering a course in Armino Turkish to get to draw attention to these uh, sources, uh, hoping that p people would really, t all they have to do is, those who know Turkish, to learn the Armenian alphabet and delve into this vast corpus of literature, uh, all sorts of literature, literature in its general sense. It didn't work. And then either Boazici or I don't know which, uh, Sabanji, uh, we, we, we, we tried, I tr they wanted to arrange for a course for me to teach this there, but it didn't work. So I'm very pleased that uh, Murat is going to do this this next semester. He will teach a course on uh, uh, Armino turkish uh, and we're all looking forward to that. And today uh, he'll talk about the language of one, the script of the other, early Armino turkish novels and Ottoman Turkish literary historiography. Uh, as I said, he is on to something new. This is only the tip of the iceberg that we've seen so far. Uh, he has discovered a few um, manuals of teaching Armen the Armenian alphabet to uh, Turks, to Europeans. Not one, not two, I think four or five. Uh, and many other uh, sources that we did not know of so far. So this is a very promising field. Uh, and I think he'll make an effort today to attract your attention to this new uh, flourishing, as yet not flourishing, but soon to be, to be flourishing field. So I'm very pleased and honored to ask to give the floor to Dr. Jankara. Thank you. Uh, I switched from physics to history and theory of drama before I switched to literature and history. So, uh, and it couldn't be better said, today my primary aim will be to attract attention to a very new field for me and I guess to many of you. But before I begin, 
I'd like to express my gratitude to the Manu Gyan Simone Foundation for providing me this great opportunity, to Kevork Bardakjian and Catherine Babayan for their support, to Mark Nishanyan for his encouragement to apply, to the staff of Armenian Studies Program, the Department of Near Eastern Studies, and the International Center, especially to Natasha, for their kindness and help. Uh, who can read this? Everybody. Not everybody. Huh? Okay, but if you really want to have access to a vast corpus, which means a corpus in English, then you have to learn the Armenian alphabet, which takes two or three days. I'll come back to this. Today I'll try to convince you that Armino Turkish, that is the Turkish language written in the Armenian letters, was not a marginal phenomenon, especially in the 19th century Ottoman capital. I'll argue how, in point of fact, it might have served as a lingua franca among the intellectuals of Istanbul, uh, a written one, a printed one, I mean. I'll first provide some background information on Armino Turkish and present some examples in order to display the variety of texts we are confronted with. Then will come the question of cultural encounter between Ottoman Armenians and Muslim Turks, which I believe is crucial to any attempt at understanding Armino Turkish. And this is where historiography will come in. And if you're still alive, the second and shorter part of my talk will focus on three Armino Turkish novels. I'd like to explain very briefly how these first Armino Turkish novels were preoccupied with the main clashes within the Armenian community and appropriated European Romanticism in a very different way when compared to early Turkish novels written in the Arabic script, what we call Turkish literature, Turkish novels. Then, what is Armino Turkish? So the first part will be the focus. The questions like who, what, why, and then the novels, if we have time. Uh, three pieces of information you're likely to encounter if you read anything on Armino Turkish, which is Turkish language written in the Armenian letters, characters, script, alphabet, mostly written by and for Armenians whose mother tongue was Turkish, Catholic Armenians, Mekitarists, and missionaries play an important role. I think the, these are the basics, but I highlighted mostly because now I know that it's not only by and for Armenians, which surprised me when I found, found out. Uh, and I guess these are the consensus points, mostly religious texts written in vulgar Turkish, not widespread, not Armenian, not Turkish. We understand all these. These are true, but at the same time, these are all wrong. Uh, I'll try to show this throughout the presentation. Okay. These are the terms you'll come across if you are interested in Armeno Turkish and if you want to do some research in uh, some of these languages. It's Hayadar Türkeren or Hayadar Türkeren, Dutch Keren, which means Turkish, Armeno Turkish, Armeno Turk, Turkish in Armenian script characters, letters. And if you go to the Ottoman archives, you'll come across these texts under the terms uh, Ermenice Harfli Türkçe İbareli or Ermeniül Huruf. Turkiyül ibare, depending on the period, date. Uh, this is interesting, uh, one interesting point, Ermenice harfli, not Ermeni harfli. This will cause confusion in the archives and catalogs, you'll see. Many people will think that these books are, or these texts are Armenian because it's written Ermenice, not Ermeni. Okay, where do we get the idea of these texts, where do we find trace? One of the most important sources to trace back Armino Turkish is uh, travelogues written by Western travelers and missionary accounts and autobiographies of these people. So if you pick <coughs> any texts from this group written and printed in the 19th century, you'll probably get something like this, an explanation like this. Uh, most of the travelers have noticed Armino Turkish and they were interested. This is interesting. Most of the Armenians don't know Armenian and they read and write in Armenian letters but using Turkish language, which is their mother tongue. This is an interesting source. An American zoologist who visited Turkey in 18. 
30s wrote this, and after this, he notes that few Turks know the Armenian alphabet. We don't know what few means, but it's something we have. And uh, reading the whole book and taking into account the people he was likely to meet with, we get an idea that these were not ordinary people, the ones who knew the Armenian alphabet or interested in it. Okay, this is the only bibliography we have uh, on Armino-Turkish. It's relatively recent by Hasmik Stepanyan. Uh, it's very valuable uh, and useful. There are some shortcomings, but it's natural. I mean, it's inevitable at the moment because we don't have specialized collections, archives, and catalogs. One of the biggest problems is uh, some of these books are being digitized without being aware of it. I'm sure even when I'm talking here, a new book in Armino Turkish is being digitized and put into a catalog, but it's very hard to access them because of the transliteration issues. So you don't have proper keywords. People who are doing this, they mainly don't know what they are doing. So you have to come up with misspellings, omit some words, retry, retry, and then you can find some of them. But this is our main source when we're dealing with Armino-Turkish books. And now, these are the figures uh, so that you have an idea of the corpus. Uh, more than 2,000 books, nearly 400 plays, over 100 periodicals uh, printed in more than 50 cities in 200, more than 200 printing houses. Uh, one of the problems in the field is that we don't know how many people, how many were these books printed. So we don't have, uh, the, we don't have uh, tangible data as to the circulation numbers, but we know things like this. So this periodical, uh, people would read it in Anatolia as well. There were memberships and people just would order it from Istanbul very roughly. Stepanian makes the following periodization. The first period is where we find Armeno Kipchak. Uh, mainly, it's the preparative, formative period, she calls it, mostly among Armenian communities in Poland and Western Ukraine. Uh, the second period is mainly dominated by missionary and counter-missionary uh, literature, uh, especially beginning with the uh, early 19th century American Board of uh, missionaries, their publications, and then the Armenian patriarchate, Patriarchate's counter-publications to respond to this. Uh, with 1850s, I don't know why she leaves that 10 years blank, but with 1850s we have the press and literature, so we get translations uh, from uh, European authors uh, like Victor Hugo, Lamartine. Uh, and in the second period of this third stage, we begin to have uh, popular literature, bestsellers. I'll show you some of these. This is due to Abdul the second censor, she says. And after 1890, no comment. Now, a few examples. When we, I love this pie chart. We've been talking over pie charts in Turkey for the last 10 years, so... Uh, this is from a PhD dissertation. The classification is open to debate, open to discussion, but at least we get a basic idea. Uh, she did, uh, my friend Günil Cebe, an important study, uh, but it's not easy to figure out the genre of a text from the bibliography because Hasmik Stefanian herself didn't see all the texts she was cataloging. But yeah, one third of these books are religious, but then literature and linguistics education. These are important as well. We'll see that there are many texts printed uh, for schools, many dictionaries. Uh, so this basically, I think, gives you the idea of the variety of texts. These are religious books. I think 
the, the increase, the rise uh, in 1830s, 70s, and 90s should be taken into account while doing research on church history in Istanbul. It's interesting. And if we look at literature, we see the golden age of Armino-Turkish literature between 1880 and 1895 a real increase in the number of publications. And we'll see that the interest in Armino-Turkish among Muslim Turks will increase in this period due to very practical reasons. Okay. This is the, the Wandering Jew by Eugène Su, printed in 1882, 1882 the best-selling novel. Uh, of the mid-19th century, which was a re really big event, especially after 1850s till 1880s and 90s, and even after that. Uh, there are many translations like this from Eugène Su and Xavier de Montepin. Uh, these are very beautifully printed, uh, two or three volumes, a thousand pages. And the in interesting thing is that we have the same novel in Greco-Turkish, some of you may know, Karamanlı, Karamanlıca. And we have the same novels printed in the Arabic alphabet, in Ottoman Turkish, what we call. Uh, so somebody has to compare those in detail to see what was going on. Because uh, it's important if there are differences in interpretation and translation, it's important if one translation is inspired by the other, which I have evidence in some cases. This is Aşık Kerem ile Aslı Han'ın Hikayesi, uh, the folk story printed in 1926. Very popular genre in Armeno Turkish publications, Leyla ile Mecnun, Köroğlu, we have many versions. Uh, generally, these include the Türküs, the songs that accompany them in the original form, Türküleriyle beraber, which makes them more important and interesting, there are eight editions of this particular story over 50 years, and some stories were printed more than 10 times. I'm not sure how many books are printed 10 times in modern Turkey over 50 years, other than Harry Potter or I don't know. But this tells us something. Okay. The following pages are taken from two important legal texts of the 19th century Ottoman Empire, Mecelle, the Civil Code, and the Armenian Constitution of 1863. Um, so the column on the left, I mean the column uh, close to me, is in Armenian. The one on the right is Armeno-Turkish, and it's not easy to realize. And I'm sure many books are catalogued as Armenian, because no one could understand that the column on the right was Arme in Armenian Turkish, or they didn't even think of it, especially in Izmir, in places like the National Library, the library in Izmir. So this is one reason why we have uh, problems with Armenian Turkish research. This is the Armenian Constitution of 1863. Nizamname-i Milleti Armenian. Again, the right column is in Armino Turkish. This is a dictionary printed in four languages in 1846 in Venice, which is one of the principal printing places of Armino Turkish, together with Istanbul and Vienna. Uh, there are many kinds of these dictionaries. Uh, even if the dictionary is not in Armino Turkish, most probably the pronunciation of the words are printed in Armino Turkish, which makes sense because you have all the vowels. It doesn't make much sense if you do it in Arabic. Even if you do it, then you have to put hareke, which is a problem, at least for the cost of printing. And please note the early Turkish language in Latin script in the middle. Okay. This is a manuscript from, this is a notebook from 19th century on black magic. The ones circled are in Armino Turkish and things like this. So if your servant runs away, you should do this so that she comes back. And these are flyers of operas, theaters in Armino Turkish and 
in Ottoman Turkish what we call, uh, and if I know anything about capitalism, Armino Turkish cannot be of minor importance. Or uh, if they printed flyers over operas and theaters. Now comes the question why. This is one of the things I come across. I don't know why, why Armino Turkish, but I have certain answers. The alphabet and national identity, there is no need to talk about it, maybe. Uh, the strong bond between Armenian national identity and the alphabet. There are people who argue that the Armenian nation has survived up until today only thanks to the uh, Armenian alphabet. So I leave it. The difficulty of writing and reading in the Arabic alphabet is one of the things we'll see in most explanations because we don't have the vowels. Uh, but in the Armenian alphabet, we can easily show all the vowels of the Turkish language, so that's why people uh, used it. Uh, the third classical Armenian, modern Armenian, we have explanations like this. Uh, for example, in Josep Vartanyan's, the author of the, Turkish, the first Turkish novel in the Armenian ar uh, alphabet, he wrote a history book, 800 pages, a thick, big book on Napoleon a history of Napoleon Bonaparte, and he says this, you may ask me why I'm writing in Armino Turkish. I would have liked to write it in Armenian, but many of you can't read it in Armenian, and modern Armenian has not developed yet. Even if I write in Armenian, I have to use classical Armenian, Krapar, so you won't understand it. I want more people to read this, so I write in Turkish. Simple. And a practical solution for those who mother tongue was Turkish. This is the explanation I came up with looking at my great grandmother. This is how I explain the situation to my students in Turkey. I ask them, have you ever seen your great grandmother reading the Quran? Say yes. Does she know Arabic? No. Then what does she read? She's reciting. She knows the alphabet through rituals, but she, she speaks Turkish. So when you put the two together, it makes life easier. The last one, I won't talk about this, but I smell something here about the material aspect of printing in the Ottoman Empire being uh, the, the owners of the printing house, type founders were mainly Armenians. And after a certain point, the Ottomans began raising questions, Muslim Turks began raising questions about the cost of printing in uh, the Arabic letters. And when European influence came, the, the cost of adding Latin alphabet to it and all that, so one has to work on this as well. Okay, and finally, these are the contributing factors. Uh, I think the modernization of education is important here because after a certain point, we begin seeing this in memoirs, autobiographies, biographies, the need for textbooks. The schools are being modernized, but there are not enough modern textbooks. But the Armenians have beautiful, good textbooks, and we wanted to read them. And some, as you will see, learned the alphabet and read those textbooks. This is an important issue. An establishment of mixed schools, high schools like uh, Mektebi Mülkiye, the, the political science school, or Mektebi Sultani Galatasaray Lisesi made it easier, apparently, for some people to learn the alphabet, to be aware of the alphabet in the class room, and the formation of a literary market after the 1880s. This is, again, like the type foundry thing. Uh, Armino Turkish made it easier to access European literature in a very efficient, easy way for Muslim Turks. I'll show the examples. Okay, the first part I have ended. Now, the question of cultural encounter between Ottoman Armenians and Muslim Turks. In Istanbul, I think this is, I mean, you know, this is a very political issue. Uh, it's very hard to come up with an answer and you find yourself saying yes or no before you know what's going on, very hard to turn it into a subject of thought, intellectual uh, activity, if this is ever necessary. There are two extremes. So one, the people lived together very happily. We lived together with our neighbors. We were in contact. We encountered each other. 
but mainly they were influenced by us, by the way, I should tell this. And so this is the one. And the, the other people had no contact. They had their autonomy. They would live together, but would not combine, would not mix, which is the main argument, except in the market, by the way, except in uh, commerce, ahsu uh, ita. This is the argument mainly of the millet system. The millet system says something similar, which is not a system to begin with, which is a certain set of practices, which was then retrospectively called a system and is totally based on judicial practices. I mean, millets were autonomous. Fatih Sultan Mehmet gave this autonomy with this document and then this happened. They would marry as they liked and the priest would do this, the haham would do this. It's okay. But then um, this was expanded to embrace culture as well, culturally autonomy. So people, I think, began assuming that there was no cultural contact either, or if there was, what was it? How? I mean, how was the language barrier transgressed? What happened there? Uh, and we should also take into account this fact. In the accounts of European travelers, you see things, evidence to... Uh, support these arguments of the millet system. Istanbul is like a Babel Tower. Uh, people, there are many people th talking many languages, but they don't come together. They are like in ghettos. This is something which must be historicized because while European travelers was, uh, they were writing these, the, the concept of race was being developed in Europe as well, on the one hand. So this is something I feel, I have to do more research on this, but they were think, thinking along racial lines. And for whom? I mean, all the people, every classes, every profession? I don't know. Evidence shows that it was not. There are major gaps in the system, and Armino turkish is one of them. Now, I'll try to prove this by showing Armino-Turkish manuals published throughout the 19th century. This is around from 1800. It's not printed. It's by an Ottoman Armenian. Miftahi Krati Hurufi Ermeniye Filisano Osmani. Did you realize that I read the version in the bottom? Because it's easier for me too. <laughs> and I'm I didn't do it on purpose. I'm serious. Anyway, so this is the key to read Armino Turkish, uh, the Armenian letters in Ottoman language, and it's not even printed. Okay. The author here says that he wrote this piece upon the request of a majority of Ottoman notables who wanted to learn the Armenian alphabet because it was much easier to read with it. And by Ottomans, he's not referring to Armenians, and I have evidence for this. A grammar, 19th century, written in English. Elias Riggs is a missionary. Uh, this is interesting as well because this shows us one other aspect of Armino Turkish because Armino Turkish apparently made it easier for foreigners to learn the Turkish language, for foreigners who wanted to learn the Turkish language, because it's not very easy to read and write with Arabic letters if you don't go through the modern education, uh, the classical educational system, which was uh, meşketmek, repeating a passage from the Quran, Rabbi Yesir Duas, okay? So they didn't have flagships and modern educational system. So this was a big problem. 1892. Osmanlıca bilenlere dört günde Ermenice. I was shocked when I saw this. Oh my God, I've been working on Armenian for hours and for months and years and dört günde, what is this? So I requested the book. I can't uh, wait. And it turns out that this is Ar Armino Turkish, not Armenian. Uh, it's by uh, Muslim Turk Ahmet Muhtar, printed in Nishan Berberian Press. It's 14 pages, two kurush, 
And on the back cover, it is announced that an Armenian calligraphy notebook is bound together with the pamphlet as a gift. And if you occupy yourself, as far as you have time, with this book, which was commissioned to my impotent authorship, be sure that you will be able to read Armenian in one or two days. This book will not only show the easiest way to those who want to read newspapers, illustrated weekly periodicals, novels, etc., written and printed in Armenian or Turkish, but can also be considered again a guide in their own language to those who wish to learn the real Armenian language. Those who are interested to read Armenian or Turkish, newspapers, translations of novels. And be sure that these are not Armenians only. He says, here again, I should note that he says Armenice in the Turkish original, which is an issue of confusion. He, he talks as if it's the language, Armenian. This is an interesting uh, putting together of the language and the al alphabets. And here's an Armenian grammar written in Armeno Turkish. Uh, I won't spend time on this, but apparently with the last decade of the century and the following decade, there is a significant rise in the number of Muslim Turks interested in first Armenian Turkish and then the Armeni Armenian language. Uh, so Armenian Turkish might have served at this point as a useful practical tool to learn the Armenian language because we begin to see Armenian in certain school syllabi. Bedroseki Garabedya, who printed the Metz Bararan, uh, Hayaren Osmanaren, the Ottoman uh, Armenian dictionary in 1907, around 1910. In the preface, he says that there is a rise in the number of people learning Armenian, not only Armenians, also Muslims. That's why I'm writing this dictionary. And at least five of the notable Muslim Turkish authors, authorities, literary authorities of the time, contributed to it. I liked your dictionary. My Armenian isn't that well. I can't say anything about the Armenian, but the Turkish definitions are really, I'm sure this will be very helpful. And this is the Armino turkish preface to the book. Okay. I'll give one example to prove what I mean when I say there is a rise in the number of people learning Armino turkish in the last decade. This is from Ahmet İhsan Tokgöz, author, translator, and one of the foremost publishers of the last quarter of the 19th century. He is the publisher of Serveti Funun, The Riches of Science, printed between 1891 and 1944. One journal that shaped almost by its own, the literary culture of the turn of the century, and he is the publisher. He's a famous translator. Before I began to read, began to understand French as I wished, I clung on to the uh, newspapers and novels published in the Armenian script in Istanbul because I had learned the Armenian letters from my Armenian classmates in a few sessions. This gives us many clues. French literature learned my, from my classmates in a few sessions and Armenian arithmetic books, we get a sense of what was going on in 1890s. And he not only read Armino Turkish, he wrote Armino Turkish. I saw a bi-weekly journal named Jihan, well, which was published in Armenian letters, but in the Turkish language. It would mimic the European style. I liked its articles on science, literature, and economy. I wrote articles for Jihan for quite a long time. Now, this is important because this generation, after the 1890s, the Servative Union generation wanted something new, new literature. And the new literature in Turkish, there was a model before them, Armino Turkish. So uh, much can be sa said about this, just these, this piece. That's why, especially in those years, in the years of Servative Union, Armenian literature and Armino Turkish literature uh, had began to be talked about. In 1913, there was this Ermeni Edebiyatı Numuneleri, samples from Armenian literature. Eight or nine stories from Armenian authors were translated. And I found last week an article printed in 18, 1913, again in Serveti Funun, by Mahmoud Esat, the, the founder of 
modern Malie, Tapu Kadastro, how do you say it? Finance in modern Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. He wrote an article on the Armenian alphabet. He says, I wouldn't dare write on Armenian literature or printing, but on the alphabet, in the alphabet I'm interested, I know the alphabet, its history, and then I'm writing this. Here one can ask this very legitimate question, why? There are many reasons why would Muslim Turks be interested in Armeno-Turkish. Political reasons, I know of at least one journalist, very influential in the 1870s, uh, would read Armeno-Turkish for political reasons. This guy is writing about this issue, I quote it here, he is wrong. Education I talked about, an easier and more efficient way of, that's uh, obvious. Uh, 1880s and 90s and the print capitalism, bestsellers and novels and the Abdul Hamid censor uh, again. This is something interesting for me. This is the last one, something I'd like to work upon. But after a certain point, I began reading things like, like this. The Muslim Turkish authors are naturally compar comparing East and West, and then Christianity and Islam. So are we backwards because of Islam or those debates? And after a certain point, some of them begin saying, let's look at our local Christians. What are they doing? And Armenians is a good example. Their education, their printing, their intellectual faculty, see the dictionaries, the books they are publishing, the textbooks. I think this is... The Muslim intellectuals, after a certain point, might have kept an eye on Armenians just uh, looking for a model of modernization, and Armeno Turkish must have played an important role there. How much time do I have? 12 minutes. Very good. You're still alive? Yeah, good. Good. Good. The second part. So I'll talk about three Armeno-Turkish novels printed between 1850 and 1870. This is the first ever Turkish novel printed uh, by Josef Vartanyan, an Ottoman Armenian, uh, um, uh, who is a graduate of the Mehitarist school in Vienna. Uh, the story of Akabi, Akabi Kaisi. This is Karnik, Gülünya, and Dikran's Horrible Death, printed in 1863. And this is Bir Sefil Zevce, A Miserable Wife, printed in 1868. See, they're all printed in Istanbul, but Astane, Konstantinopol, Bolis, all these different, under these different names. Um, they're all printed in Istanbul between 1850s and 70s. Very little information on the authors. No place in literary historiography. Neither Armenian nor Turkish. And not even, I mean, modern historiographies. You cannot find the names in RPR, RPRians, which is almost, who is almost their contemporary. He wrote a book on the literature of Turkish Armenians in Istanbul. And he doesn't even mention a name. Uh, written in colloquial Turkish, which is a very interesting subject for the development of Turkish prose. Uh, stories take place in Istanbul and only among the Armenians, which is again uh, a very wonderful exercise for those interested in theory, literary theory. Why? Influence of romantic literature and melodrama as a genre. And the question of the Turkish, the first Turkish novel, which I like. What do we mean when we say Turkish literature? What is Turkish about Turkish literature? Um, maybe we'll talk about this if we have time. Tragic love stories, reminding Romeo and Juliet. Young lovers cannot unite in the end. Protagonists either die or commit suicide. And the dividing line, always, the line between the lovers is religious, political, and it passes through the family, which reminds me of a biblical theme. those political and religious dividing lines, the one between Catholic and Orthodox Armenians. <coughs> so Catholic boy loves 
Orthodox girl and they can't come together. And it's made clear that they can't come together because of religion. Because throughout the novel, the, the priests are always making it sure that they don't marry because their marrying means the union of the churches, which is said plainly. They can't marry. This means the churches marry. Sahmanat Rutyun, the Armenian constitution, again a very important dividing line. One whole novel is based on this. People are very clearly divided into two against their position with respect to Sahmanat Rutyun. Hasunists and anti-Hasunists, the division within the Armenian Catholic community is one of the subjects. And young Armenians against Amiras. So, um, love, the status of women in society, individual versus society or tradition or authority, modernization, westernization, education. These are all represented in connection with this main clash, with these main clashes. And it's, it's about the redistribution of power within the Ottoman Armenian community in Istanbul. Okay, this is just, I don't like dichotomies and I'm sure it's easy to deconstruct it, but... Um, I think the authors didn't want it to be deconstructed. They wanted to make sure that these dichotomies were clear. Uh, so the young, beautiful, good, liberal against authority, it can be church, tradition, patriarchal, supports the Armenian constitution, has gone through new education, modern education, read newspapers and novels, know French and other foreign languages. They are mainly merchants. They have nationalistic tendencies. Uh, for example, one of the protagonists, she's interested in Askain Yerkler, the national songs, and her father is very angry. And romantic heroes, whereas old, ugly, evil, conservative, submissive, against the Armenian constitution, classical education, no foreign languages, hate the new ignorance who read newspapers. They're mainly Amiras or in relation, in iltizam, in tax relationship with the Ottoman government of the time, against these new and dangerous trends like nationalism, they drink, gamble, beat women, and think and say horrible things about women. It's unbelievable. It's like a caricature. Okay, just one example I'll give from one of the novels, how politics and love and everything is merged. This is a novel... Uh, we, the, the novel opens up in a graveyard. We see a young, beautiful girl who is about to kill herself, Gülünya. And then a young, handsome boy comes and saves her. And they talk for 60 pages, which is one third of the novel, on the graveyard. <laughs> and we learn that this girl is trying to kill herself because her ex-boyfriend, late boyfriend, was dead because of her father and after a debate on the Armenian constitution. He was so pissed off, he beat him and insulted him and he was dead. So she's going to kill herself. And it turns out that the, this young saver is the best friend of the late boy. And he asks, would you love me instead of him? And she answers with a straight question. Tell me first, are you for the constitution or not? Lakin kerem buyur. Sen efkarcı sahmanat ragan mısın yahut değil mi? The boy's answer is just as sharp, just like Karnik. I'm one of those who shed blood for the sake of the constitution. Karnik gibi sahmanat rutyun hakkında kan dökenler denim. But I have to note that here kan dökmek is not the modern... Uh, it's not to kill somebody, to sacrifice a Jan Vermek. So there is this semantic shift in Armeno Turkish novels which we should be careful about while reading. Okay, the final part. When I compare these novels with the novels, what we call Turkish novels, Ottoman Turkish novels, the first examples in the Arabic script, I see a, an interesting dichotomy. Because the authors of the first novels in both traditions, they were influenced by European Romanticism and they would read the same text like Chateaubriand's Atala. Uh, but I think they would understand and appropriate these texts in a very different way. Basically, in Armeno-Turkish novels, we see the revolutionary side of these 
of this romanticism, uh, whereas in the Ottoman Turkish novels we see the conservative uh, side. The patriarchal uh, authorities never disputed. Love means probably destruction, not revolution. Uh, reading is something that must be controlled, and the authority of the old must never be something uh, to be neglected. Patriarchal authority is not evil. Uh, this is something I think about. Why and how I mean the details. Um, I think it, it gives us an idea about the class structure, structure of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, why these two different romanticisms? Because it's interesting, after 20 or 30 years later, Muslim Turkish authors will begin to adopt the same themes in Armeno-Turkish novels, which must be something uh, to be thought upon. Why and how? Why this time shift? Like the phase difference in physics. Uh, <laughs> come back to physics. So I said theater, I said physics, and I showed charts. So I'm using my educational history, uh, which makes me happy. Um, the issue of cultural encounters, I touched upon that. Empire and novel, this is an interesting theoretical debate. So is it possible to, in, in a multi-ethnic and multi-religious empire, can we talk about uh, the novel of the empire, or can we even uh, take it up uh, as an entity, or can we take up these novels synchronically, or again, the class structures like the Armenians being related to more uh, merchant bourgeoisie, uh, as Fatma Mugegecek uh, talks about in her book, and the Muslim Turks being more of bureaucratic, Bourgeoisie, what does that mean? Does that tell us anything about these novels or the structures? The non-representation of Muslim Turks is an important issue, which must be, why don't we see any Muslim Turks? What does this mean? Does this mean that they had no contact? Is it possible? Not even one name, not even one mentioning of a name. Was it because that they were only pre preoccupied with the internal clashes and wanted to say symbolically something about society? There are many explanations. Was it because, because of the uh, literary conventions they were trying to appropriate, like uh, melodrama? Because the world of melodrama is a closed one. It's always closed. One never, I mean, it's, it's on an island. It's somewhere, but uh, you don't have contact. And the development of Turkish prose is another important issue. We're talking about the Turkish novel, and this is always said, there was no proper prose in the Ottoman Empire, which the first authors of Turkish novel would base their prose upon. But there, there was Armino Turkish, which is incredibly plain when compared to the novels written in the Arabic script in their time, or after their time. Uh, so there was, there was a plain prose Turkish. It was possible. These novels show us that. Armenian Turkey. Um, I don't know if this makes sense. Were they Armenian? Were they Turkish? I really don't know. Uh, if you look at the themes, there are common themes. Uh, for the Armenian, they're only among Armenians which maybe makes them Armenian, uh, but then it's in the Turkish language, which makes it Turkish, because what is Turkish literature if it's not Turkish? Because the first Turkish authors were not Turkish. So the author of the first Turkish novel, Shemsettin Sami, was Albanian. Nam Kemal was not Turkish, ethnically Turkish. So uh, I don't know if this issue makes any sense. Here I'd like to stop saying this. This is what I'm interested in now. There is an overlapping in these four processes and I'd like to know why. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>